Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Nicole, and welcome to the Artist Dialogue for Checkpoint Theatre's Two Songs and Story. Thank you for joining us today. It is my pleasure to introduce the creative team of Two Songs and a Story, co-director, dramaturg, and joint artistic director of Checkpoint Theatre, Huzia Sulaiman. Hi. Co-director, co-cinematographer, and editor, Joel Lim. Hello. As well as our writer, composer, performer cast of Anne's Tra. Hello. Inch Tra. Hi. Joe Tan. What's up? Rebecca Sangeeta Dorai. Hi, guys. And Weish. Hi. Two Songs and a Story is an online video series of five solo performances that weave original music and storytelling. It is available from now until 31st August, and tickets can be purchased on Cystic at the link pinned in the comments. So I had the great privilege of being present for each day of filming, and it was truly amazing to see the work that went into crafting this series that explores the multitudes of human vulnerability and connection. So I'm really excited today for the team to share with you about what the two songs and the story creative process has looked like has looked like for them. So at the end of this session, we'll leave about 15 minutes for Q&A. So please feel free to leave your thoughts and questions in the comments section, mm -hmm. and we'll do our best to respond to as many as time permits. So I'd like to start today's conversation with Huizia. Um, as we all know, theater and the arts have been hit extremely hard by COVID-19. So what inspired you to create two songs in a story for this particular time? Well, Checkpoint Theatre made uh, a quick pivot to refocus ourselves as original Singapore storytellers across mediums, platforms, uh, and disciplines. So we weren't especially affected by the existential threat that the, the closure of theatres would otherwise pose to a theatre company. And for a long time, I've been wanting to put music at the uh, forefront of work that we do. I mean, it's always been a part of it, uh, most recently seen in our extensive collaboration with .gif, uh, Waish is one half of .gif, in Displaced Persons Welcome Dinner. But then but going back with a lot of our other projects too, and in fact, going back to City Night Songs in 2012, where it was an original devised uh, musical uh, in a way. Um, but I, 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 I wanted to put together a piece with a number of artists who I knew had both uh, the music and the words to speak to something about what we were all going through in this time uh, of pandemic, of isolation, of anxiety. So my brief to these five artists was to um, think about something that can be told or explored with both with both music and monologues because i knew they had multiple abilities as as writers as co composers as perf or performers of both music um and text uh and and it was an extensive process of development with them i think we did six weeks or rather i did six weeks individually through zoom with each of the five artists uh with i think about roughly weekly zoom calls where there would be new drafts and i would bring in more and more members of the checkpoint team each time so that we were getting more and more feedback on it so that was also an opportunity to rehearse uh, and because they were all quite diverse there were different levels of engagement that was needed um sometimes it was about asking them questions to, to pull out what is the heart of what they want to say. Other times it was refinements. Can you talk a little bit more about this? Can we maybe be a little shorter on this section and a bit longer on this section? So I think there were, there were varied um, strategies with working with the writer performers. Simultaneously, Joel, Joel Lim and I uh, were having discussions about how we would shoot these things. Uh, so we developed five different visual languages or rather i would say joel originated those five languages and and through feedback and comments uh, with myself we we jointly arrived at how we would shoot them we had five days of shoot and then they followed about four or five weeks of editing uh where joel would do his first assembly and it would come to me and then there would be a sort of long several rounds of sessions about how we refine and put together the performance so we were able i think to marry the intimacy and immediacy of a theatrical performance with um, the wonderful visual opportunities that working in the, the, the screen medium uh, affords you, like the ability for the camera to move and that language to, to lend itself to elevate the piece. Thank you. Um, so speaking of your collaboration with Joel, um, Joel, this is a 
completely new kind of relationship that you have with Checkpoint Theatre for two songs in a story. Previously, you've mostly worked on our promotional materials and trailers, but this time you were present throughout the development process from the initial script read to the very moment the videos came up online. So what was that like for you to have this different relationship with Checkpoint? Uh, it was... So there's, there's a... In, in my daily work as a commercial director uh, and, and photographer, it was actually such a huge luxury to sit through a rehearsal process. Uh, the most I get on a commercial set is um, we do the casting, we, you know, we spend a lot of time on casting, and I see casting videos and blah, blah, blah. But when I get onto set, this is the rehearsal. I get onto set, it's like, okay, you're the mother, you're the daughter, you love very much, you love each other very much, you're handing over the heirloom, okay, and action. <laughs> so it was to, to, to be able to sit through several rounds before getting to set and watch Lucia uh, Craft these these performances with the with the artists and also being able to 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 comment on it and let the performances sit in my brain, uh, it, it it yeah it just felt like it, it just felt so fulfilling and such a luxury to be able to have that then to craft the imagery around that uh, yeah so that that's the the, the big big takeaway uh, from from this project for me. Um, yeah, and it, as an example, um, the thing that really, because all these rehearsals were done over Zoom, so the the one uh, uh, set of rehearsals that 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 were really uh, that really spoke to me was was Raish's because it felt like as if uh, Raish was actually just zooming me, and she was my friend, and she was talking to me directly and so that that then informed uh the the visual language to make sure that 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 wasn't lost uh with with all the fancy camera work and stuff great so for Huzia, how was it like for you as well crafting that visual imagery for each of the performer how did you um how did you decide what you wanted to use in these filmic experiences for each different work I think it was very much a conversation with Joel, uh, and, and one of the interesting things that we uh, were able to do was actually pare things down. So we, we will notice, for instance, in the first video in the series, uh, Ant Chua's, the, the, the camera tracks into ants as they perform their piece uh, slowly. It just goes, goes, goes closer and closer. Um, and that was actually the, the kind of what Joel and I arrived at because we'd also had a second degree of change originally planned where it, it would shift in post-production from black and white to color. But on the day of the shoot, I think we realized that it was mesmerizing in and of itself just to slowly go in close uh, to, to, to Anta's face. And then we realized that with that and the cutaways to the ukulele, uh, a profile shot that was very beautifully lit with Joel's uh, sidelight, we, we didn't need um, to have that additional layer of visual complexity. And so there were similar conversations, I think, happening between us for each of them. Uh, I know that for Inch, from the very beginning, Joel had the idea of, of multiple cameras, and we, would, uh, we were really playing with the idea of the space. And I think that was Joel's uh, response to the sense of claustrophobia that one feels in Inch's text talking about um, sanitation in, in migrant worker dormitories during COVID. So we put Inch in a very large empty space and that's that, that contrast of the space becomes both liberating, which is what the subjects of the piece don't have, but it's also sort of oppressive because it's one person there. And I think for us, it highlighted the poetry. And, I, and you know, Joel was using the camera, sometimes static, sometimes moving uh, in certain ways. I, so there, were, there was a similar level of planning going on um, with each piece. I think Joe did a lot of work for us uh, in the sense that on the page, a lot of the imagery is written in uh, to, to, to have behind. Uh, I think jo Joel wanted to go green screen instead of just uh, Joe was like, no, no, we just need a Zoom background. But Joel said, no, let's, let's shoot green screen. But I think it added to the, 
the the fun of it also choreographing in the space with you know um our one of our crew members hands holding the day and then uh joel's assistant pushing the desk into place so there was a, there was you know there was a lot of joy in making the visual language and the arrangements work for each piece yeah, so what amazed me was that even though the visual language of each piece was so different and each work was also conceptualized individually, there was a very strong thread running through all of them that to me kind of centered on this notion of vulnerability, what it means to be vulnerable, what it means to explore vulnerability. Um, I'm wondering if maybe, Ant, you could speak a bit about the role that vulnerability played in your piece and also what prompted you in that direction. Thanks. So... I think my piece is a lot about friendships and also about being hurt and hurting other people. Um, in in my deepest, closest friendships, there's a kind of safety that you have where you feel like you're allowed to make mistakes, where you're trusting the other person with a version of yourself that is, you know, maybe foolish, maybe a bit careless, maybe even sometimes mean or even cruel. Um, at the same time, there's something really vulnerable about admitting that either you've hurt someone and, and you know you're saying sorry it requires like a lot of vulnerability to to admit that you've been wrong um and there's also something really 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 vulnerable about saying that i've been hurt i i was hurt by something that you did um so something that's been uh, i've been reading a lot about is how do we account for the ways that we hurt each other um how do we how do we think about these small details that seem insignificant but can actually haunt us for a really long time? Um, something else that I'm thinking about in terms of vulnerability is that you know there are some things that you might be very public about, but only when you get the chance to speak on your own terms. Um, and that's something that's been really lovely about this process, where I really felt very strongly that the subjects that we've been broaching in the videos, we've been completely allowed to shape the, the amount of disclosure that we go into um, I think confessional writing is often seen as like journaling, right? Like it's so raw, it's so cathartic. Um, and like, yes, it, it may be cathartic and maybe raw, but it's also choosing the ways in which you're allowing yourself to be vulnerable that um, that can open a conversation with the audience, that can welcome the audience to participate in this act of thinking through certain issues or certain emotions. And that requires a lot of craft to transform these feelings into, into a vessel that you can pour yourself into that is beautiful, that is comforting, that is also challenging. Yeah, thank you. Um, Wish, I'm wondering if you could speak to the same topic, just because your piece also had that in very intense vulnerability to it, and it really felt um, like I think you were extremely generous in what you invited us into with your piece. Um, so anything that you can say on this issue would be would be really interesting to hear. Sure, I'm resonating very hard with what Anne has just said, um, in particular, how difficult it is to admit that you've been hurt and to say that out loud. I think that's something I've struggled with all my life. And I guess also that process of writing and self-censorship, like because of the journalistic nature of it, you kind of, is this too indulgent? Nobody cares about my 3 a.m. ramblings. Everybody stares at the ceiling and has incoherent thoughts, you know? Why is mine so special? And um, <laughs> so it, it was just this kind of constant anxiety going into it. Um, and when Jose approached me, I really didn't want to write about this thing, um, which was an, an, an incident from last year. I. I really didn't want to write about it because it was already sort of invading every part of my life and my psyche and I just wanted to do something completely unrelated to claim back some part of my life that wasn't colored by trauma. Um, but then it just felt like everything I started, all the other stories I tried to do were just so distracted and it felt like 99 of my thought, 99 percent of my thoughts are occupied by this thing but I'm only giving checkpoint this 1% and it just felt unethical at the end of the day. So I decided I would take the plunge and um, I never wrote about the incident itself or, or described anything in detail, but that kind of allowed me some safety and some distance to look at it, I guess, you know, 
at an objective distance and observe the daily things that have changed about my body and my life uh, since. So I guess it was difficult because I'm the sort of person that likes to like act like hunky dory as my mom likes to say <laughs> and pretend that like I'm 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 I've got everything under control. So it was it was um challenging but very cathartic and it wouldn't have happened if Jose and 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 the whole team didn't make me feel so safe um from start to finish. If Jose hadn't teared up with me on our first Zoom call and made me feel like I had something worth saying or something that would make someone else feel something, I guess I wouldn't have gone so far and really opened up in the way that I did. So I, yeah, I really have to thank the team for, for that. Thank you. Um, Sangeeta, I know for, for you as well, writing this piece was also a way of writing about something that you don't usually talk about. Um, yeah, so how, how did you approach this aspect of vulnerability and also yeah, just using this piece as like a, a place for you to speak about topics that you often leave unexplored as well. I think my experience, um, I think Wei said it really well because there were moments when, I think when I first started this, I had another monologue about um, anxiety that served as like a springboard of sorts. And the difference was that I had already um, found some, I was still in the very beginning stages or a, a very nascent stage of dealing with what I had just come to terms with in terms of my struggle with anxiety. So even though that was a jumping off point, when I was looking at other things to write about, similar to Wage, I just kept coming back to the very same thing. Uh, there were like 99 things I can talk about, but there was that one thing that was bugging me at the corner of my brain, especially because we were writing not just a monologue, but we were writing songs. And when I write music, um, my relationship with music is that it is in every fiber of my being and if i don't feel for something i cannot write about it and if i uh, and, and and similarly i can't sing with honesty and so i told myself okay so this is what i need to write about uh and then eventually if I, and when it was when we started writing it was definitely very very difficult um because there were a lot of emotions that came up there were a lot of things that came up um, because in my journey of healing, um, a lot of different people take many different steps when they heal, as did I. Uh, but this is one step. Putting the words into music was something I had not done before. Or if I did, I kept them very, very private. So to finally decide that I am okay, I am safe to write it and bring it out was a big decision. And the fact that I was able to do it on my own terms and the fact that I wasn't doing it alone really, really helped. So for example, I really appreciate it. Um, even on the day of filming itself, I really, really appreciate it who's there being there and being a friend and being like, okay, we're gonna have a Tetari and a Milo and we're gonna talk about this. And I tell you, I really, really appreciated that. I would not have been able to make it through the shoot without that. Um, and that was, I guess, the same relationship I wanted to have with the audience and speaking about things that are so, so difficult and not making it something uh, very big and performative, but just keeping it something intimate and sharing it like I would with a friend. Yeah, great. Um, so you mentioned the filming process, and I think particularly because of COVID-19, the filming process and development process looks so different for us, what with everyone, the whole, the whole crew being in mass during filming, all the rehearsals being via Zoom. Um, how was that? How did that kind of affect your creative process? Did it make it easier to reflect on certain issues or did it make it more difficult? Um, maybe Inch, you could speak a bit about that. Yeah, it was definitely a very different process from normal, but I do, I actually really did enjoy our like routine weekly catch up sessions and being able to sort of ruminate on my own because the challenging part for me was actually just not so much the performing but the writing part for me so being able to feel safe and write and go back and then come back and have feedback and each time as well when we do it like um the the our, each of our rehearsals we would have a little bit more of an audience like more people from the team would come and watch so it definitely did feel like a bit of preparing for a presentation of some sorts but all directed to your camera or something like that so it, it was definitely a very different experience and even the when we got to the space and I finally had first 
human contact or what, what seems like human contact for me as well was an, a bit of adjustment because I even just feel slightly disconnected to myself because I'm having a mask while I'm trying to speak and I almost feel like what I'm saying as well is quite muffled. So that that's an interesting challenge. And then finally, I don't know, maybe it worked as well because by the time when you're ready and the camera is there, the crew is ready for you, it just feels extremely liberating for me to just like deliver what I needed to deliver. So I, maybe it's one of those things where you're just like preparing to uh, un unleash your clip clipped wings, you know, sort of a situation. <laughs> Um, so it's just to kind of follow up on that, you mentioned that the writing process was difficult for you. Um, was it because of the subject matter you were dealing with or was it about the process itself? Yeah, it was definitely the subject matter or, or rather, I guess when, cause I, because I was doing work in the sanitation, sanitation in the dorms, um, it, there is a different kind of energy that I have to bring during that time, that kind of responsibility. It's a different mask that I have to wear. I'm on the job. And as much as it would be great if I wore the artist head, I'd be like, oh, wow, all this is such great material. That's highly unfair to do that for the job that I'm actually doing. So... Um, it really is prioritizing the work. Hence, some level of, of muting was required on my part on self-censorship. Like, I need to self-censor my emotions, self-censor what I'm going through and just get it done. So it, it, it took a while to sort of excavate and unpack all of that because it felt like so much happened within a short duration of time. And I would be going out I, for two months I was doing it. So And at its peak, I was out almost every other day. And I'll be out like, and it, it varies because it'll go out like, I'll be out at like 2 a.m. in the morning till 5 or till sometimes it'll be like noon to 6. And usually you won't even know where you're going until the day before. So it's a it's a lot of compressed experience and everything feels extremely surreal after it happens. And by the time you hit your bed or your showers at the end of the day, you're like, you. I'm usually questioning myself, what happened? Like, I don't even remember. So that a lot of emotional memory is sort of like kept under wraps. So being able to sit down and that week after week, just writing, sort of unpacking that and decompressing all of it definitely took a little bit more time. It's like an emotional hangover you need to get over. Yeah. Um, so turning to now, Joe, because your piece has a very different kind of emotional pace to it. Um, how did that feel for you filming in the studio, especially with the green screen, which is something that I think most of you as live performers, it's not something that um, that you would work with that often or be that accustomed to. How did how did that how did that feel for you? Um, I mean, it was it was great. So I mean, like I, I think I, I want to echo what a lot of people have said, which is that the the ownership we have had over this project. So I mean, uh, I, I've written some stuff on stage before, but for this, I was like, okay. So when Hussia said it would be like short film, I was like, okay. Let's write it as a short film, and like it's not like I have like a lot of experience writing short films. I've like written some webisodes for an octo series. That, that's it. Like, and I have no idea how it's gonna turn out. So, so, so I was like, ah, oh, I want this on green screen. This is what's happening on the green screen, and this is what's going on. And then, uh, which, which was so um when to, to show up and watch everything materialize. So when the green screen materialized, and the two and the two of Joel's assistants materialized, pushing this table towards me, it was really like, wow, this is pretty amazing. But of course. You don't see the final product with the green screen until the viewing itself. So when I saw what happened, what, what they'd done with it um, earlier uh, last week, uh, I, I was just, I was really floored because uh, I, I loved, I loved, I loved the Althea's uh, illustrations, uh, which brought this anime in my mind to life. Um, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. I mean, I, I would say that uh, the difference between mine and the other people's pieces is that mine still needed some sort of imagination to figure out what was going on because I wrote a green screen into my script, but uh, so so um, but but yeah, I was I was really so uh, excited to see the product. At the same time, the level of ownership was uh, I think when 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 it started to daunt me was I think uh, the second last rehearsal when Jose asked me, so have you choreographed the song yet? I was like, oh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I forgot about that. It's just me. It's me doing that, isn't it? And then I had to go and like. Look at look at Sailor Moon. <laughs> look at like different sort of movements that they might do in an anime. Uh, I hope you've said, for those people who have seen it. I I don't know how you feel about it. My mom was like, "Wow, you can dance, ah," which like I suppose I'm happy about. <laughs> yeah, but but nobody else has really told me about the dancing yet. But uh, yeah, I mean, th th there was so much ownership, which was fantastic. It was just such a. 
I, I loved writing something and because it's it's a lean team, but it's also such a capable team and just watching everything come to life and having a hand in everything that happened and I, I, I really I really loved that. I mean that was that was so much fun. Yeah. Cool. So Wish, your piece also had that edit element of post filming editing put into place. Um, and to me it worked super well the way your loops came in with the edits that Joel um, that Joel did as well. How did how do you feel it? How do you feel the pieces work together for your piece? Yeah, um, big ups to Joel and, and, and Hosea for having that vision and for actually managing to cut that in such a way that it was precisely the effect I was going for with the with the arrangement of the loops and the music and how the loops would both interrupt me or harmonize with me, but you know, kind of flood over the lines and take over in the way that when your thoughts get noisy, it's kind of a you know a sonic metaphor for for that kind of noise. Um, and then the visual noise that that Joel put in with the the sharp cuts and the multiple faces. Uh, multiple knees kind of just at war with each other and kind of sprouting out from each other. It, it really feels exactly like that. And I, I was just really floored by how, how in sync it was with, with, with the music and the intended effect of it. So thank you guys so much for kind of elevating that visually and making me feel like more than just a person in a room um, with so much sensitivity. It was, it was super cool. The looping effect as well, I mean, you drew from a kind of Beckett, like I think you mentioned like drawing from like Samuel Beckett in your work too, right? That kind of um, yeah. stream of conscious thinking. I can't run away from that man. <laughs> like um, Samuel Beckett, man, he haunts me. Um, and I didn't think about him at all till, till Jose mentioned in one of my earlier drafts that there was a sort of Beckettian effect, like a bit tragic comic. Um, stream of consciousness with these absurd bits and re repetitive um, loops and lines and then we kind of made a more conscious choice um, to work that into the form as well with the help of technology and looping yes that's the perfect I guess um, you know way to materialize these eddies of thought and and, and layers of, of, of noise so so yeah yeah, and I think Anne's, your piece kind of had a different approach where it was more minimalist. And I think like what Husia said about the camera going into your face, it had that very, when I watched it, I really had that sense of being invited into a space with a friend. Um, so how did that, how did, did you feel like that added intimacy to your piece? Was that something intentional about the way that you wrote it? Mm, I think something that I something that I decided on fairly early in the process um, when Jose first brought the idea up over a phone call was that I really wanted to create this sense of intimacy with the audience. Um, like, yes, we are, we are more than just one person in the room, but also the simplest of things that we all missed so incredibly much during the circuit breaker was that just having another person in your room. And... I think Sangeeta mentioned this uh, in another chat that we had that this Zoom theater format or video theater format um, brings a new kind of intimacy with the audience. You know, they're inviting us into their homes. People are watching from their sofas, from their beds. And I wanted to build on that as a, as a kind of feature of, of this particular way of performing um, and, and use that as part of the direction of my piece. Um, I think the filming also took place on like the first day of phase two and you know friendship was suddenly legal again so from like only seeing this much of everyone to seeing their like in the flesh four people with like lower torsos um, I think that that definitely also was something that fed into my piece that sense of like we were disconnected we were just video calling we were maybe a bit alienated from each other but at the end of it, there's still some kind of hope for different kinds of connections and different kinds of new intimacies. So this is something that we've kind of moved a bit towards the use of or how music 
interweaved itself into the text. So I'm wondering if Sangeeta, you could talk about how, yeah, how you how you crafted that into your work. Were there some things that you felt the music was able to capture that maybe the story wasn't? Um, and I'm asking you specifically, especially because your piece had that very interesting music video quality combined with the personal interviews. Um, yeah, so please share, tell us more. Yeah, for me, this is like a dream come true. <laughs> this is a dream I had for 20 years. So it was like a two decade dream come true. And now people are wondering how old am I? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to have a music video my entire life. So when finally, when we were talking and uh, uh, the ideas about the music video and the idea of how the music was going to be um, shaped, uh, in, in this uh, two songs in a story, I was very, very excited. I was like, oh, wow. And But I wasn't uh, going towards that when writing the music. Um, and there was also a keen discussion. One of the biggest things that I think we did that really, really helped the piece was that um, in speaking, Husair was like, well, why don't we take away certain things from the monologue if it's already being said in song? And that helps the monologue be less performative and less expository if I'm already going to be singing about it. And I struggled with that for a bit. I was a bit like, ah, but I really want to say this. But then afterwards, I told myself when I sang the song, I remembered how I felt when I sang the song and I realized, yeah, actually certain things don't have to be said. If I can feel it when I sing, then that's enough. And if I can feel it, then the people who hear it will feel it too. And there was the idea when I wrote the music, uh, typically when I write, I have different processes. Sometimes I write um, lyrics first and then I put it to music. Sometimes I, I have a music in my mind or a tune and then I set, I set it uh, backwards and forwards. So for this particular piece, um, for the first song, because it was so difficult and because it was so painful, I, I had set the word, I, I, um, I could not find the words. It was very, very difficult. So I had the music first and I found a piece of music that uh, kind of felt like what I was feeling. So that's kind of my relationship when I write songs. So when I listen to a piece of music, I would go, this sounds like grief. If I listen to a piece of music, I'm like, this sounds like happiness. And so when I listen to that piece of music, what I heard was the name of the person who had hurt me a lot. And it was the name of the person with, for whom I, I wrote that song to, which then developed into the words when I wrote. Um, sort of like a letter for him and I could have written uh, a monologue for him but then I decided uh, if I had written a monologue for him it would not have been so powerful and I would not have been able to speak the volume with which I sang it and then came me charting the journey through the monologue and then finally the last song where we were like okay this is this is it this is time for us to really break free and let go and it was very 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 fun uh, to kind of chart that uh, journey together with Husera and the team. Yeah. Mm. And can I just say, singing it made me feel like, at first I was a bit like, oh, I like Katy Perry, oh, I got music video. And after that, I finished the music video shoot, I was like, oh, I'm better than Katy Perry. <laughs> Your performance had a very Adele quality um, to me when I watched it. It definitely had that wow factor. Um, so maybe, Joe, I mean, so Sangeeta, you talked about how the music, you listened to the music, you felt an emotion and you kind of went with that. But for Joe, I feel like your music was, you were thinking very specifically about a genre and putting that in. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so. My favorite anime of all time is Ranma Nibunu Ichi. Nibunu Ichi, I can't even say it properly. Ranma Nibunu Ichi, <laughs> if you're just like a, a really, really old uh, manga slash anime. I've, I've read all the, all, all, the, all, all the books and finished the anime as well. Um, and it's really, it's really stayed with me throughout. And uh, actually, the theme song I would say is very heavily influenced by one of the theme songs, which I've memorized from from Ranma as well. <laughs> and also, I, I just thought, um, yeah, you know, it's it's it, it was a uh, it, it was it was such an interesting experiment where I was asked to like, okay, write a song. I have almost never written a song before in my life. Accompany myself on the song again. I have almost never done that in my life. Uh, choreograph the song write a script, uh, sort of like include stage directions to the script and then perform it. So I was like, hey, what else can I do? Let's put everything I can do in this in this show. And uh, I, I actually studied Japanese for, for six years. I was like, hey, yeah, that's good. Okay, let's put some Japanese in. But my Japanese isn't actually that good because I, I have not spoken it in uh, many, many years. So um, a, a lot of the influence uh, of the song was taken from like the Japanese sort of that, that you hear in some in some anime theme tunes. So I was like, yeah, if I don't know the, 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 the Japanese part, I'll just use English. This is great. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it sort of um, 
um, so I forgot your question. But anyway, so, so I mean, it's, it's sort of all in the spirit of uh, the piece, which is that I like to do a bit of this, I like to do a bit of that. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, let's just put that all in there, half and half. And it's okay. It's, 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 uh, we just have fun with it. I, I think that's the spirit of it. Yeah. I think Jo, with, with her customary charm, is, is vastly underselling uh, the, 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 <laughs> the amount of work she did. So she creates a character who's in love with an anime. Right. She invents the entire anime. She invents the situations of the anime. She composes the theme song of the anime and the words of the anime uh yeah and and uh yeah and she calls into existence something that 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 doesn't actually uh exist and so you know it it's multiple levels of creation she creates somebody who's in love with a thing that is itself created uh and that's you know quite a wonderful achievement thank thanks Zia. <laughs> thank you yeah that's what i meant to say <laughs> no no i mean the, the, the proof of the success is that I got a message saying, hey, where can I watch this anime that is in this piece? And I'm like, uh, actually, sorry, it's all made up. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just Ranma. People can just watch Ranma. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so Inch, for you, what was it like interweaving the text with the music? Um, your piece had those very interesting like sound effect moments that you did, be it like playing that really jarring chord on your guitar, or like making the sound of your, like the sound of your phone's ringtone, I felt like there were these like small moments in which you kind of inserted all these little like musical tidbits. Um, could you tell us a bit about what it was like interweaving the two for you? Um, I think from the start when I was working on this piece, I well, when the whole thing was two songs in a story, I was struggling with the two songs only because I felt my one experience kind of felt like a never-ending blob of one thing. So it was very hard to kind of dissect two beats of two songs and two moments and those things. Uh, so when I, but it, it was eventually, two, um, I would say it's one song with two very different phases. Because um, at the end of the day, the root chords were the same, but it kind of meandered in and out into this sort of like weaving in and out into this like sense of consciousness or yeah, and self-censorship. I think that was what I was trying to hopefully go for. Um, or at least it was the song as well served in a way where you know it's where I'm allowed to be vulnerable, which is at the start before I leave the house and when I feel safe when I'm back home, uh, when I feel transformed back into being a human being instead of a a, a working person, uh, a walking mask essentially. Uh, so uh, to to me. It, I've always liked the idea of sound design and just more sounds in between. In fact, if if, if I had it like completely, <laughs> like if it was left to my own devices, I think would have been littered with a lot more guitar chords all over the place, a lot of underscoring and a lot of like own self, own self do sound effects on the spot. <laughs> Who's here reeled me in because he definitely, he, he, he felt that it was um, like, I didn't need to put any of these bells and whistles. In fact, it was very important for me to be as, uh, authentic and, and simplified and I think that was very helpful for me because I think um, I guess that that part of me that just wants to flourish every beat or to to sort of present it in a particular way just kind of loses the 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 plot or, or rather that vulnerability that comes with it so having a director that distills what I was my experience has really been very helpful mm. thanks Guzir yeah, you're um, very welcome so, Fuzia, beyond two songs and a story, when you first conceptualized this series, did you have um, an idea for what kind of arc you wanted to connect the five individual performances with? I think it would, uh, I think it obviously related to this period um, and this time that we're living in, but obviously on a more, um, on, a, on a more subconscious emotional level, I was, I was sort of, surprised and I, I mean I did not expect that Inch would have a, an experience that directly related to confronting the pandemic but all of the the heightened emotions that we are going through as a result of COVID I think found their way into the various themes of this piece be it friendship and what does it mean to to care about friends and lose friends and not be able to 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 speak to friends uh in inches piece what does it mean to engage directly with contamination and fear but then also you know restriction and the sense of 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 possible oppression um and then joe's that sense of escape uh fantasy um being taking ourselves out of ourselves because we were all of us in our houses for two months and and whether it was a japanese anime or you know a beach in 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 wherever we wanted to some of us wanted to be somewhere. 
Uh, and then about you know, looking at healing uh, in Sagita's piece, looking at, at trauma in uh, Weish's piece. I think, I think there were all these things that be- they came from the artist, but they felt extremely right because we were all responding to the times that we're living in. I briefly had an idea of, oh, maybe we should look at different hours of the day. And you see sort of Joe's piece response to one o'clock. Uh, but then I realized all the other artists are, um, and I say this with great affection, creatures of the night. Uh, so, you know, I sort of didn't, didn't want to uh, order things uh, according to the hours of the day. Yeah, but, but, I, but I think those themes sort of naturally emerged. And then how about for you, Joel, when you heard the, when you, when you heard the, f- the five pieces, did you have a kind of visual um, imagery that you wanted to connect the five pieces with? Was that something that even came to mind? Uh, yes, it, initially it was, uh, there was the intention to do that. But as the pieces, as the rehearsal process went along, uh, uh, they, because the themes was was so 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 strong in themselves, it just so happened that when me, Wazir and myself discussed how we were going to approach each individual piece, they just they just the puzzle fit together. Yeah, and 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 it was um, it was in the end uh, just a case of where we put each piece uh, in the playlist where each would each and, and it just it just it just fit even even some things that seem so out of place as uh as joe's joe's piece it, it it fit because of the honesty and i think that was the, the the whole theme of everything it was everything was so honest uh everything uh you know we were talking about powering down the performance and everything and that 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 went throughout into post-production as well because the performances never and the writing as well never ask anything of the audience so it never asked the audience you feel this way you or you know you should feel this way now or so we wanted to make sure that that didn't come through in in the in the visual sense as well uh we didn't want to manipulate the audience into feeling anything it was all about just enhancing the writing enhancing the 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 performance um yeah so that that that's where where I, I felt in terms of visually uh, when when we looked at all the all the pieces. Yeah, I think one thing I'm quite excited by is the fact that we have um, essentially transplanted the checkpoint theater aesthetic or style of, um, as you say, Joel, not asking the audience to feel anything um, or not signaling too much, but but instead doing our best to represent with integrity a certain kind of emotional authenticity and a lived experience of course crafted you know to 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 as high a literary standard as possible with as with 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 uh, as deep and nuanced uh, performances as possible but there's still that i think restraint and respect uh for the audience that i know is you know informs uh all of the directors who work in Checkpoint, whether it's you know myself or Claire or some of our of our younger collaborators, um, and and I'm 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 extremely pleased that we were able to embed that. I think Joel in our collaboration uh, in in this as well. Um, yeah. I, I, there's there's something about uh, what I think all these five artists have done in in two songs and a story, which is we spoke about vulnerability earlier. Uh, Nicole, in response to your question, and I think there's something I want to call attention to, which is that the vulnerability that all of the five artists bring to this piece is not self-serving. Um, it, it, it requires an immense amount of courage, but also discipline uh, to be able to, to open oneself up, provide uh, an incredibly honest experience but also understand that it is not for the benefit of the artist themselves it's for the benefit of the audience it's to it's to invite you as the audience to consider something to consider your own life uh, in in light of what the artist is is so generously 
uh, revealing, you know, sometimes at, at, at personal cost, uh, sometimes with a great deal of, of anxiety that goes before it. There was always, a, I think for each of the five, there were different comfort uh, zones of comfort and zones of, of exploration and growth. And, and I'm, I'm sort of so, so proud of each of them, but each of them sort of stepped out of their comfort area uh, in certain ways. Um, like Inch, Inch, for instance, you earned your songs. So even though obviously you're, you're you know, very famous as a singer songwriter, I think that because you'd gone through the spoken text and the stories, by the time you got to the forever um, and, the, and the anguish that you brought to those lines, uh, there was that sort of palpable electric sense of, of having that you back in your comfort area, but informed by the fact that you'd stepped out, uh, out in a, slightly out of your comfort area in delivering a monologue as yourself, as Inchua, that was from your lived experience directly to the audience. And I think in different ways, uh, all of the five writer performers both masterfully demonstrated their own comfort zones, but then also stepped out of them to, 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 to a place of growth. And that's all for, for the audience's benefit. Great, thank you very much, Wizia. Um, so right now, I think we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so the first question we have is from Lucas Ho. So what are some novel processes slash new discoveries from the making of this show that you will integrate into your art making practice? Maybe um, Ants, you can speak to this first. Hmm, novel processes or new discoveries from this show. Actually, maybe I cannot speak to this first. Can someone else go? Uh, Joe? Joe Tan? Oh, uh, um, well, uh, okay. Interestingly, uh, I mean, I've written a bunch of scripts. I was lucky enough to have written a bunch of scripts uh, in this past year. A lot of them uh, helped through with uh, Checkpoint as well. So I think uh, my scripts tend to be pretty, like, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's like, like, I, I, I like, uh, I, I play like, 12 different characters or something like that and then I, and then also I think I was developing uh, something with with Suzier, uh where actually it was informed uh, by my own trauma as well uh yeah which still continues to make me very angry and at the point of writing the script uh continues to make me very angry and very sad as well and then I think I wanted to sort of just go there's just so much going on and now I'm stuck in this space where nothing's going on I'm stuck in my house and I want to write something where nothing happens, nothing really happens. A woman decides whether or not she wants to watch anime during her lunch break. And that's the entirety of the piece. Um, so it was a bit scary because uh, I don't know whether I, I, I didn't know whether I could do that, like whether I could make writing about nothing uh, interesting. So I think, yeah, it's, it's opened up new ways of writing to me, I suppose, and, new, and uh, possibly new ways of new ways of performing, I would say as well, because how, how, do you, how often do you get a chance to check? <laughs> Unless like you are like, like Weish, who's like constant having this constant ongoing relationship with Beckett, right? Like, I mean, how 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 often do you have this chance to just do nothing <laughs> on screen? So yeah, that was that was fascinating. I mean, exploring the limits of of nothingness, I suppose. That was interesting for me. Uh, Sangeeta, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I was just about to jump in. I think maybe I do. I did have one new discovery. Um, that hit me um, really hard in making this that's more of personal. Like I know just now I was joking like, mm, yeah, I'm better than Katy Perry, but uh, it was a big deal for me to actually encounter that in my art making practice because I constantly, um, uh, anxiety aside, I struggle always feeling like I'm always very, very critical of myself. I always undersell myself. I always, always feel like I'm never good enough, that I always will never match up to people, that my work is never good enough. And um, I always compare myself to other artists as well, um, whether local or otherwise. And I always say like, that is the benchmark, that is the benchmark. So I remember even in terms of music as well, I always felt like okay, that's kind of what I want to be like. That's who I want to be like. That's who I should sound like if I want to um, sort of make my craft. But then... I remember when we had a watch party um, and I saw uh, myself in that music video, I cried, I cried like a baby, I bawled my eyes out. Because when I looked at myself and I looked at the work that we as a team had created, I realized, oh my God, I'd never have to compare myself to anyone else ever again. 
I, I told myself, Sangeeta, you are a benchmark. You are a benchmark of where you've come from, how far you've come and where you want to go. So then for me to even say like, yeah, I'm better than Katy Perry. Like, it was an incredible amount of healing, not just emotionally, for me to recognize that um, from now on, all I have to look at is where I need to go and never feel like I'm lesser than anybody else. But it was also just, um, it was a mix of two things. Um, one is um, in my personal life, like I mentioned in the monologue, um, to be able to put so many um, things to rest and feel like, yes. I am capable, I am stronger than I give myself credit for. And then on another level, in my artistic practice uh, as, an, as, a, as a writer, performer, singer, to go like, yeah, this is where I'm at, and this is where I need to grow, and if I fail some days, that's okay. I just pick myself up and keep going. So to have both converge in one project, it really, really meant the world to me. And that is something that I will definitely take going forward into my um, future art-making practice. And that's something I'll definitely hold very dear to my heart. And I'm very, very grateful for. Yeah, thank you so much for, for that. Um, does anyone else have anything to add about this? Um, I know this was a, a very emotional process for a lot of you. Um, so yeah, so if anybody wants to add anything to this. Okay, if not, I think we can move to the second question. So um, the second question is from Cheyenne. So Cheyenne says, congratulations, it's been very inspiring to see work being made in a difficult time. How is the creation process like for all of you? Also, what advice would you offer other artists about creating in this time? Uh, maybe... Think, maybe I can jump in um, and also respond a little bit to Lucas's, which I earlier deflected. Um, something that's really uh, been a huge part of this process is just extending care to each other checking in on each other emotionally outside of the work. Um, like that, that is part of the work, that is the work as well, to make sure that each of us is healthy and well and um, like physically, mentally, emotionally. I think it's, it's such a trying time for each and every one of us in different ways. And even though it really feels a bit like we're speeding back up with phase two and you know, new things are reopening, um, I think it's, it's just such a fundamental part of this process that, I mean, at least for me, I've, I felt very much cared for, very much seen and heard, very much um, just so sensitively looked after outside of the creation process, just as a person. How, how are you? How are you doing? What, what did you have for lunch? Um, just being careful with each other, I think, is so important. Thank you. I think this leads us very nicely into the next question, um, which was from Hong Ling, who asked if... Um, Sorry, I'm just going to read it. Stop talking about Cheyenne's. Are we going to... Is anybody going to respond to Cheyenne's question? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. We can... Yeah, if you don't have <laughs> other responses to Cheyenne's question, please feel free. Um, there are quite a few. There are a couple more questions lined up, so I just want to make sure we okay. have. Okay, sure, sure. Um, advice, advice for, <laughs> advice for creating work. How about you, Joel? What do you think? I think. Do, do you know what? It is a difficult time, but it's. Uh, it also let let us down this path because uh, I've been this busy work before. I was working, you know, finance, and I was just completely bored out of my mind and I wanted to, you know, stab myself every day in the eye, looking at spreadsheets. Uh, and then I went into photography, uh, that gave me a new lease of life and then into filmmaking. Uh, but for the past 10 years, most of my work has been commercial and it felt like that was happening to me again. You know, my, it was my passion for uh, the visual arts was really starting to smolder and this this project because of COVID uh has really you know been a kick up the ass and I'm like yeah let's do it man let's let's go for it so I guess uh in terms of I guess I, we have embraced that times have changed uh it is difficult for, for a lot of people but you know let's let's take the let's take this opportunity to uh to embrace some of it and 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 
I think it's 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 forced us to think in, in different ways, and I think that's good for creative. It's always good for creative because we're always always on a path. Of, uh, a lot of us are, are we, we get entrenched in the path, and it takes a takes something to knock us out off that path and realize that hey, you know, we could we could do more with with whatever we have. So, yeah, I think yeah, just taking the opportunity to to, to let that happen, I suppose. Anyone else have any advice for Cheyenne? Artists creating work during this time? I mean, I'd say that everybody's doing something very different. Sorry, sorry, Pisa, did I cut you no, off? No, go ahead, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. I, I, I would say that everybody, like, like like what Joel said, everybody's jumped into doing different things because they can't do uh, what they've been doing. I mean, like Dwayne Lau's been making jewellery, uh, Darren Gore has been making cookies, and you know what, like, they are really damn good cookies. <laughs> and I don't know, I, I suppose uh, it, it's such a trite government speak to say upskill, diversify. When you have no choice, I suppose we just try. And also, just, just try and see what else you're good at and how you can perhaps integrate that back into your art making later. And also, I, I think that um, part of this idea of Zoom theatre is, is the great equaliser, right? I mean, I know that this is not Zoom theatre, this is video and we have a very experienced team working on it. But you see artists everywhere just going, screw this let's, let's let's put this on let's put this on youtube let's put it on zoom let's put it and yeah just do what's the worst that can happen people will just be like that's a crap youtube video <laughs> you know it, it, the, that's the very worst that can happen but first of all just take this time to experiment yeah that's what that's what i think yeah. great um so the third question that we have is from hong ning so she says, as many of you have shared, it's certainly not easy to write on the topics and experiences that you have chosen. Would you be able to speak about what helped you in your drafting, editing, rehearsal process, apart from the support of Jose, Joel, and the checkpoint team, which you had which you had discussed, be it in terms of safety, of having artistic and emotional control, and so on? Maybe Wish, um, could you speak to this? Um, sure, yes, and you, you you predicted right in your disclaimer that I would have spent a long time just talking about the support of Husir and, and Joel and the team because honestly that's a huge part of of creating that, that sense of safety that people care very deeply on and off camera, creative process or not, or outside as a person as Anne was saying earlier. Um, that was the main thing that, 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 that provided that kind of safety. Um, but on a, I guess on a smaller level for me, this format was strangely comforting to me as well. And as I was listening to you guys responding to the earlier question and Joe, you talking about just experiment, lah, you know, and just kind of discovering these little joys that, yes, we all miss the magic of the theatre and all having, you know, having physical bodies share the same space and there's something very beautiful and magical about that. But watching a slow zoom into Jotan's face as her mouth twitches ever so slightly, you know, or like, or just, or just watching how inches inflections in her voice and, and, and how that changes the look in her eye, you know, these, these small things make you feel so close to a person that you know them intimately in a way that you've never known them before. And I think being like, you know, in the fourth or the sixth row of a, of a theatre space kind of doesn't afford you that sense of safety, not just, um, I mean, I'm sure it does for some people, but for me, like being extremely anxious, just having a few people in the room and who's here saying, okay, talk to me. You're not talking to a big audience. It's a confessional. You're hanging out with a friend. I'm your friend. Talk to me. I'll stand right behind Joel and just talk to me like you will talk to me like you know how what kind of tone would you use with me uh or you know in that that kind of thing so i think the format of it really helped and kind of having um input with the writing along the way as well really helped and i was very conscious about i know this topic is very delicate and very personal and i hope that doesn't mean you don't feel like you can tell me what needs to be improved and you know I, i'm very conscious about the fact that this is a hard thing to critique because it's something that you know is so raw and delicate so just 
building those safe spaces, having the distance of a screen somehow, being able to secretly be in your underwear while wearing something decent from waist up. I'm wearing pants now for the record. But, you know, just these, these sorts of vulnerabilities and comfort zones that you can curate for yourself in a room, in a rehearsal space, that somehow, that somehow really helped me, I suppose, um, be, become more open with, with, with the team and eventually with everybody. Inch, what about for you? Um, so what helped you in your drafting, editing, or rehearsal process besides Huzia, Joel, and Checkpoint team? Um, that I need a lot of time to unpack things and that kind of time is really quite hard to dictate it's not like having a deadline it's not like uh, I mean I do work better under deadlines like if someone gives me a deadline I feel like pressurized and excited to hit it most of the time uh, but when it comes to anything emotional like even in that process like I realize you don't really get a, a good uh, sort of reading on what actually happens or emotional I, I like to call them emotional hangovers. It's like after you're being vulnerable, vulnerability hangovers, where you're just literally after being vulnerable, you kind of go into this like weird hangover state where you you kind of don't, you can't even logicize what you feel or, or, or the series of memories and, and stuff like that. So to me, I realized that instead of, as an artist, I think um, instead of trying to pressurize myself to write, I think I should plan a little bit more hit for and account for these vulnerability hangovers. Like I need to start putting that, calculating that into the process as well when I write so that I don't feel tense or pressurized in the moment to actually fulfill something or all these like tangible other things that that that, that people do to kind of keep, to function in the world, like, you know, and, and still stay in check with myself. Yeah. Great, thank you. So moving on to our final question. Um, this question is for Huzia. So this is from Kirsten Tan. Um, she asked, could you unpack a little about how slash why you selected these five particular artists for the show and what were the threads in your curation? The common thread was talent. Uh, talent across different disciplines as well. So an ability to be comfortable with music and saying things in music, but then also having a voice and a style and a craft when it came to writing and, and the performance of text. Um, other than that, I, I, I think it was, I, mean, I spoke to a number of people who were not able to feature in, in this lineup for reasons of, of timing and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so, the, the, you know, it, it could have been a slightly different lineup or could have been a slightly bigger uh, series, um, but I'm, but definitely the initial impulse of why the people on the list had to do with their ability to bring a fresh perspective and a voice uh, to to something across both song and monologue. Um, some people can do one, some people can do the other, but I think it's rare to have people who can both write and perform in both modes of expression. Uh, so that's, yeah. That's really four, four, four things that they're doing, and you know, choreographing as well. In 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 the case in the case of Joe, um, and I think it's also people that you know. I some of them I am I've worked with more extensively than others. Some of them I'm closer to uh, hitherto uh, as 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 friends, but I think it's also trusting them enough to know that I don't have to do very much. One of the things I think I've learned in my practice as a as a dramaturg, as a director, as someone who works with with writers, is that I kind of no longer feel the need that to to demonstrate that um, I have something to say or, or or that that I'm clever, right? I think you know when you start out in your twenties, you have to show, oh yes, I've got to, I've got to say something very clever and wise and and help shape this. But then so I'm now very comfortable saying, no, they brought something fantastic to the table. Uh, I'll just say, okay, maybe can paragraph three, you know, be a little tighter, but on that, it's great. Um, and, and I actually don't, I don't, I don't mean to under, under, undersell it because it's taken me a long while to achieve this level of minimalism and trust. And I think, um, I'm actually very proud of the fact that I'm able to just 
have an instinct about who would be great, choose, you know, approach uh, a bunch of great people of whom five were able to make it for season one uh, of Two Songs and a Story, and to also work with them in a way that that trusted them and gave them, um, in, in, you know, as, as Joe would say, both great power and great responsibility uh, in terms of, yeah, you, you want to choreograph your thing, you choreograph your thing. Uh, but yeah, but, but yeah, that's, that's been the, the extremely happy sort of outcome of this collaborative process. And I, and I do want to say that it's all really made possible by the fact that Joel and I really were able to form a common language. It's been slowly building over the years, right? Because Joel shot amazing stills for us. And in recent years, like incredible promotional trailers for our, our stage plays. But I think going into this conversation, we quickly found uh, a common language and we were able to spark off each other. Uh, and I'm looking forward to our dinner tomorrow night where we talk about our, <laughs> our next project. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It just just to reinforce, I mean, something that I really learned from Hosea uh, throughout this process was I'm very used to manipulating others. Okay, let's do this. Uh, you should be, you know, let's just change the, the thing here. But every rehearsal, uh, after each performance on a Zoom call, uh, what, what really struck me was Hosea would always ask, first question, how the artist, how do you feel? You know, and it was, uh, it, it may be, it may, it may be normal for you, but it wasn't, it was not normal for me. Um, and I would say that it was to just to, to, to reinforce what Hazia said, that a common threat amongst all, everyone here is the talent to write and to perform it as well. Uh, I'm very used in my line of work to uh, polishing turds. And in this case, it was very much what Hazir was saying uh, earlier. We had this conversation. It was, they were all diamonds. And all, all, all we had to do was just chip away and make it shine. And that, that, that was it. I'm so, so it was... glad you took us to a different image. But... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> that was an a, a <laughs> interesting note for the outro. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's. You know, yeah, it, to to be part of this this whole thing, I'm very 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 proud of it, and it was such a pleasure to uh, work on it from beginning to end, and then at the at the end as well. Sometimes post processing, post post production is is, is a real real pain, uh, but it was uh, it was very much a pleasure to. To, to edit this and to craft it with this year uh, into its final uh, final state. So yeah, thank you guys so much for you know telling us your stories. Uh, yeah, it's a really really good experience to work for with you. Sorry, I lied about that being the last question. We have another question from the audience. Um, I'm just gonna ask it, and maybe if we can have brief answers, that would be great. So this is from Wei Li. Um, Thank you for the wonderful work. You were speaking of new vulnerabilities and intimacies in the screen medium and the possibility of compromising on that in the act of performance. How was tapping into this vulnerability different performing for the screen medium as opposed to live theater slash stage performances? Yeah, so I think we I think we only had time to address part one. That was part one of their question. Who would like to go? Um, maybe Anne, would you like to address this question? Um, tapping into this vulnerability, uh, I'm going to be contrarian um, and say that actually it was not super different for me um, because similarly, Jose was behind the camera when I was, when I was filming my, my part. And it was very much the same feeling of um, you are separated by some distance. You may not always know how the other person is reacting, but you are reaching out and hoping that somehow through the alchemy of your writing, your performance, and just the dynamics in the room, that somehow this reaching out forms a connection with someone who's out there listening. 
Great, thank you. Um, does anyone else have anything to add? I'm going to answer part two. <laughs> part two is, with Joe's piece, how is it different for writing this into a fictionalized character rather than as a personal confessional work? And I'm just going to say, uh, I always put different names on the characters I write, but uh, actually a, a big part of them is me. Uh, that's me, that's me watching Ranma right there. So yeah, it was very much the same. Okay. Disclaimer that Jo doesn't actually watch anime in dub because her performance was so compelling that I got angry. I was like, Jotan, how can you watch anime in dub? You must watch in the Japanese. She's like, that's just a character, please. It's fiction, wish. <laughs> yeah, I choose, I choose when I wanted to be fiction and when, when, I, when I wanted to be me. So for your purposes of your question, yeah, it was, it was me. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, who is it? I think I, yeah... I think one of the aspects about um, about how vulnerability was used or preserved or that that human connection, I think, has to do a lot with Joel's, uh, Joel's lighting uh, and and his lenses, because there is a way in which the camera can potentially become um, intrusive and 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 searching uh, and 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 put the subject under a very harsh lens. And of course, we stayed away from that. Uh, and there's the way in which the camera and the lighting can glamorize or exoticize and actually remove the subject from us. Um, and, and, and we very much also wanted to stay away from that too. So I think there is a sense where what Joel arrived at was to treat the subjects with tenderness visually, uh, with a great deal of respect visually. So it's neither about um, glamorizing and exoticizing them, nor about uh, you know, rendering the uncomfortable subjects of, of, of our gaze. Uh, and I think walking that balance is, whether it's articulated or it's just part of our aesthetic and our values, I think that's the key to translating that sense of connection and vulnerability from the medium of live theater to, to the screen, especially when you have personal, confessional, talk to the subject, uh, talk to the camera kind of subjects. So on that note, I think we should close the conversation. Um, but also before we end, does anyone have any final thoughts they would like to share? Um, any final reflections? That Sangeeta, you are better than Katy Perry. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think, yeah, you're my stronger singer. <laughs> well, then you. It was a revelation to hear your voice. Asa, how are you not an international pop star? <laughs> But, but you know, there's, there's also the thing where you don't, it's not about whether, and I pick up on Sangeeta's point uh, about she being her own reference point, and I don't think it's whether one is better or worse than artist X, and I don't think it's like at what level, what level of fame you are, in which market, and, and, and you know, which... Uh, economy is structured such that you can access to this kind of audience. It's not about that. I think it's about the integrity of the performance and how uh, you hone your craft uh, and how much honesty uh, there is in that that moment of communication between you and the audience and your collaborators. Uh, and yes, Sangeeta and, and the other four of you should be extremely proud of what you've done with your song and story. And, you know, I will echo Joel's thanks to all of you for sharing your stories with, with me, with, with, with Checkpoint, and, and with our audiences. So thanks for that. It's, it's been a learning experience. It's been, a, um, been really exciting. Uh, and I'm really proud that, you know, it, it, it con we've opened, it continues. We have until 31st August uh, for, for audiences to, to enjoy this. So thank you all. And thanks, Nicole, for this evening. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. So yes, so thank you, Huzia. Thank you, Joel, and Inch, Joe, Sangeeta, and Wish for really just generally sharing your artistry with us and for taking the time this evening as well to speak with us about your work. Um, so at Checkpoint Theatre, we believe strongly in the power of stories and in particular, original Singapore stories. So as with Two Songs in a Story, we will always find a way for these stories to be told. Um, and if the audience can come to us, then we will go to them. So we hope you've we hope you've enjoyed Two Songs in a Story. And Two Songs in a Story, as Huzia says, um, will run until the 31st of August, 2020. And you can book your tickets at Cystic if you haven't done so already. So please do share your thoughts and comments with us on Checkpoint Theatre's social media platforms. And thank you very much for joining us. And good night.